All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We are live. Full screen this. Meet the Masters. Tim Watson. I'm joined today by my friend, Master Rob Kloss. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon to you, my friend. Thanks for taking the time out to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. And I'm honored. Honored to be here. How's it going? All is well. Yeah. It's, uh, fabulously chilly in my office. I got driven out of my man corner today due to homeschooling. So <laughs> came here and, uh, you know, because I'm cheap, the heat's not on and it's really cold in here. <laughs> I, I honestly, I think that's normal for any karate school in the, in the winter is you get in and for the first hour, hour and a half, it's frigid. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty chilly in here, and forgive all the mess behind us. We're in the middle of a makeover right now. My office usually doesn't have you know 120 uh, fluorescent light bulbs in boxes <laughs> in the rear. But you know, I'm the guy that needs like his pen properly. If you remember, you worked here. I have to yes. put my pen perfectly straight. My office looks like a bomb hit right now, and my OCD is like. <sighs> but it's good for me. It's good for me. It's making me. It's making me stronger on some level somewhere so how was uh, obviously 2020 was not easy for anyone how how are things at cornerstone and you guys persevered through a lot you uh were very uh your ingenuity came out <laughs> and figured out how to have classes so how'd you how'd you manage your way through all of that yeah, that was uh, that was that was interesting. Um, uh, Master Maybroda and myself are uh, it's like two chimpanzees with a monkey wrench banging on a laptop trying to figure out how to do Zoom classes. It <laughs> it uh, miraculously it worked, and uh, the feedback we got was good. We're still here because we have uh, we have an incredible following. Our students are incredibly loyal and supportive. Um, many of them have gone above and beyond what anyone could have possibly expected them to do. Uh, in terms of, of contribution um, in, in, every, in every facet of the game, uh, teaching classes, run, helping us run the Zoom things, um, even some of them, uh, some unsolicited financial, uh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze, it's not COVID, so everyone don't duck. There we go. I'm allergic to cats, and of course, you know, we just celebrated a year with our cat, so <laughs> but for punishment. Um, yeah, even uh, like unsolicited financial contributions, people were just amazing. And uh, they really, they, they got us through it mentally as well as in, in every other phase of the game. So we learned a lot about Zooming and we even went, uh, we, were, we were doing outdoor classes deep into October. I think actually we did a few in November too, when it was really cold out there and we just made the decision we had to come back inside because I was freezing my instructors to death. But we had like 200 feet of electrical cord. And I don't know if you saw the, the videos on Facebook. We had yeah. construction lights out in the field. And I saw your uh, your black belt promotions and everyone was in like hats and gloves. Yes. Uh, we actually did that on my on my private property around a very large bonfire. We, we graduated black belts under, uh, under star legs. It was actually really cool. That's, that's cool. It reminds me of those stories that, you know, Master Godwin say and that he got promoted at a picnic. And, you know, it was more of a, a family kind of vibe thing going. So. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it was. I had a line of uh, solar powered, like fake torch things going down my property into the and people, you know, following the torches. It looked like the little sprite things from Brave when she's like walking into the woods. That's what it looked like. They were going down there. But it was an awesome night. I mean, it's, you know, it's the best that we could do, but it was so much better than you know, delivering their black belts, their mailbox. And, blessing them as we ran by or something like right. that. I think we still succeeded in making it special. I'm, I'm sure I have no doubt and we'll we'll talk more about like Cornerstone and, and your students as we go through. Uh, believe it or not there are people watching so uh, <laughs> uh, Tara says good afternoon. <laughs> you, you, you may be familiar with uh, her. Um, Tom Lyons says hello. Uh, Lindsay and Natalie from the UK say hello. And Pam Russell from Region 5 also says hello. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Master Claus, feel free to share. Um, Don't answer anything from Tara DeRico. <laughs> or Joe Kaluzny. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> it's a one word answer for anything Master Kaluzny says. <laughs> awesome. So, 
uh, you've seen the interviews. The, the main one I like to start with is, it's an easy one. How did you get your start in the martial arts? When, when did you find the inspiration or I guess where, and uh, you know, how'd you get your start? How, and how'd we get to where we are now? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a long story, but let's start with the, the how'd you get your start? Well, early in uh, early in 1985, I, I signed up at Shin Karate Institute in uh, April of 84. I, I wish I could remember the exact date. I used to have it in a planner and somehow moving 500 times as you do in a, in a lifetime, it, it disappeared. And I think they lost the original records at headquarters. So anyway, it was April 1984. Earlier in 1984, I got my heart broken for the first time. Uh, you know, the first, the first big crush, uh, the girl that was like, I thought out of my league, uh, you know, came to me and, and, uh, and I, I, of course, being um, not of the, of the greatest uh, self-esteem and self-image and things like that, fell madly in love with her and then had my heart thrashed and stomped on a little bit later. So uh, I was looking for something to uh, get my mind off of that, you know, anger issues, sad depression, all that stuff. And uh, athletics was the way I was going to do it. Um, I'd always been a, a pretty decent athlete up to now. I'm only 18 years old, so it's not like I had this huge track record. But always had been a good athlete, baseball, football, uh, street hockey, things like that. And uh, the, the sports culture in Southwest Philadelphia largely re re uh, revolves around bars and tap rooms. And I was smart enough to know that alcohol and, and my anger issues with getting dumped were probably not the greatest idea. Uh, for some reason, maybe a flashback to a Chuck Norris movie, I decided I was going to try martial arts. Um, I opened the phone book and I found the two closest ones. The first one was the Philadelphia Karate Club in West Philly. It was a Shotokan school, a very, very good, and I think there's still a very good Shotokan school in Philly. They didn't answer the phone. The next call was uh, Shin Karate Institute at 709 Oregon Avenue. They answered the phone, and uh, that's that was the beginning. Who so who answered the phone? Do you remember? Uh, it was a young second degree black belt named Mr. John Godwin, <laughs> and he told me, uh, uh, "You have to come down and watch. It's a two-hour class. You have to come down and watch the class, and we'll talk afterward." Okay, I, I mean, I knew nothing about martial arts except what I saw, you know, Chuck do on screen. I don't even, we didn't even own a VCR yet, so I hadn't even watched my first Bruce Lee movie yet. <laughs> but uh, I went down, I talked to Buddy into going with me, and we went down and uh, Shin Karate at the time, it wasn't, the downstairs wasn't there. The downstairs was, I, was, I, was, I think it was a carpet warehouse, but it may have been like a mattress warehouse or something like that. It was dank and it was awful and it wasn't part of us. So we were up the long, you know, insanely steep flight of steps up to the second floor. Went up there, uh, he met us, he sat us on two metal, hard metal chairs in the back of the room for two hours. Paid no attention to us the entire time. At the end of the class, took us in the office and said, well, do you want to sign up? And I'm like, yeah, sure, let's go. And my buddy said, okay, and we we're going to come back uh, that Monday with the, with the down payment. And uh, I showed up on Monday, my buddy chickened out, he didn't come with me and left me alone. And I signed up for karate lessons. It's back when they used to, uh, they had a stencil and you'd get your new uniform and they'd put it, and they put the stencil on it and they would spray paint Shin Karate on the back of the <laughs> uniforms. Wow. Yeah, it's good times. You didn't get your <laughs> uniform that day because you had to wait for it to dry. <laughs> but I like how they, what were they going to do with it otherwise? Why didn't they just stencil them ahead of time? I should trade? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they were going to return them to Asian world or whoever they bought them off of back there. It was a, a, a rite of passage, like, oh, yeah. man, look at this. <laughs> yeah, you signed up and you got your uniform the next time you came in, you know? Gotcha. But, so what were classes like back then when you started? Was it uh, mostly Master Godwin teaching? It was, yeah. Yeah, it was Grandmaster Shin's school. And, you know, uh, you were taught from the beginning. You walked up the steps. The first thing you did was you walked straight ahead to the office. And whether he was on the phone or not, you would gently knock, bow, and say, Hung Su Kun Ring, and move along. And sometimes he'd, go, he'd raise a hand and look at you. Sometimes he'd give you a full-on hello. If he was on the phone, he might not do anything. But that was the most important thing was. Uh, but he never actually taught any of my classes. It was always um, Mr. Godwin back then. 
and uh, occasionally there were other instructors that would cover like a Friday night. Uh, I remember uh, Master Irwin, he was a terrifying man, an awesome martial artist. I think he's uh, Master Homshek's stepdad, I think. I think so. Master Homshek can read me out later if that information is wrong. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, awesome martial artist, but a terrifying man to a brand new white belt. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have many other classes from other people at that point, it was mostly him. So they were two hour classes and everyone warmed up together and then uh, you'd start doing basics and then when you ran out of stuff to do you sat down and you waited you waited until the attrition was just the black belts and then when they got done um, he'd probably pick one of the black belts to come back and show you something so they were taking turns coming back to show you blocks or kicks or whatever so just very different very different vibe very heavily masculine classes back then probably like 90 percent male and uh, young. Right. I remember uh, one of the stories you told me about being a white belt and feeling inferior to some of the a couple other white belts that had started right around the same time as you. Yeah, yeah, there were two guys, um, George Yates and Frank McLaughlin. Uh, I, I still have contact with uh, Frank on Facebook. He was a real, uh, he turned out to be like a real mentor for me. The guy was an amazing fighter. Awesome. I think I, I think I still have indents right here from his front leg sidekick. You know, my, my waist is like bowed in on one side, never came back out again. Um, great guys. The thing was, we were all white belts, but um, those guys had previous experience. Um, I think Frank was already a black belt in Shotokan, and George Ace had been a brown belt in a different Tungsudo Association, and Shin Karate made him start a white belt. So I'm in with these guys and they don't tell me that they have previous experience. We're just all, you know, white belt buddies, sort of kind of near the same age. And they are beating the everlasting crap out of me. I'm like, why do I suck so bad at this? <laughs> I thought I was a good athlete. I'm awful. This is terrible. Then they told me later, like after they got the most improved award for the color belt test for like the ninth time in a row or something like that. Oh. Don't feel bad. Well, thanks. Thanks for telling me now. You're ringers. <laughs> yeah, they were truly ringers. And I didn't know. Again, you know, you don't, you don't know. I mean, it's not like today where, you know, Facebook and YouTube and you have all these resources to kind of investigate things. Back then, it's like, you want to know about karate? Go, go sign up for karate. You weren't allowed to watch classes unless you were going to sign up. Yeah, I, I remember one of the first times I went, I saw... Uh, it was at a, I went to a Kahunaville tournament before I'd signed up to watch uh, Master Priest compete. And they ever, a bunch of people had uniforms on that said Black Belt Club. And uh, I just assumed they were Black Belts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whether, regardless of the, it's like, well, they have a Brown Belt, but it says Black Belt Club. So they must be a Black Belt, or, you know. <laughs> there was a time a hundred years ago where Black Belt Club meant Black Belt Club. Right. <laughs> and it was all black belts. I, I remember that. And then all of a sudden one day it changed. Like, want to join Black Belt Club? I'm a brown belt. Well, things are changed. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Can you tell us about some of the the people you had the opportunity other than the, the two guys that you just talked about, you know, with uh, the opportunity you had to train with uh, there at Shin Karate? Oh man, it was a there, there was an all-star roster back in the day. Uh, uh, Master Fisher was a classmate of mine. He was senior to me. Um, uh, the late Master Michael DiPietro was in that school. He was a tremendous uh, fighter, technician. Uh, we, we actually tested for Master together, even though he was my senior. I think he, he, he dropped out for college or something and then went back in. I'm not completely sure of the storyline on that. Um, Master Convento, who's no longer with the association, but he was a, a world champion. Uh, he was a classmate of mine. Um, guy named Albert Un, Master Un, which no one now, at least 30 years later, are going to know who he is, but he was another terrific uh, Tung Sudo guy, and he was another one of my instructors. Um, I got my black belt with uh, Master Kathy Hopkins. She was one of my um, actual graduation classmates, and oh my goodness, there were so many people there, it's hard to keep them. Master Gordon was one yeah, of them. say the Gordons? <laughs> yeah, the Gordons. I, Master Gordon, I owe him my job. <laughs> He kind of did an end around on my instructor and let him know that I was available for employment. That's how I got involved with Korean Martial Arts Institute. Um, trying to think of, of who else was down there in those years that were senior to me. And we had guys that were coming through and training 
with Master Godwin all the time. Um, he was kind of like a, a magnet right. at, the, at the world headquarters there. So there were all kinds of people that came through. I can't cute. think of any other masters off the top of my head. They'll come in tonight too in the morning. I'll be sure to text you. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. <laughs> so, um, so someone sent down in Tung, Tung Sudo says, uh, would you go back to the old style training? I think that, I think that we all try to implement it to a certain degree, but I mean, the, the days of making someone sit down <laughs> uh, when they run out of curriculum. Yeah, no, there are, there are, there are elements of the old days that I absolutely would love to bring back. Um, one of them without, without uh, going off on a tangent would be making contact again and bringing some of that uh, intensity back into the training. Um, I think breaking into, into groups is much better because you get a lot more instruction. I mean, I remember how hard it was, even at 18 years old, uh, you're nice and warmed up. Now go sit with your legs crossed for a half hour. <laughs> it won't get to you. <laughs> May have taught patience, but you know, you know, you're going to lose some good people that way. I mean, make them work hard. Right. <laughs> make them work. There's, there's, there are some aspects of the old days that I, that I do miss it for me. It was really good. It was really good to have, to have come up in that. Um, but I'd like to keep the toughness, but also keep the, uh, progressive, I guess, aspects of what we do. Sure. <laughs> uh, Jovell asks, have you broke any doors with your karate kicks in your firefighter job? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's really not an idea to kick a door that you don't know what's on the other That's side. Right. Yes, yeah. I told yeah. my kids. There's these the things now called dead bolts that they didn't have in the Chuck Norris movies. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I've got, I, they give us fabulous tools to do those, do those kind of jobs. <laughs> so going back to that Shin Karate era, uh, I've seen the posters and heard stories of the mysterious world of Tung Sudo uh, demonstrations. Did you tell us about some of those? Like, were you, did you get a chance to watch them, be a part of them, both of them? Yes, yes to both. Um, I was, I was kind of the invisible man for a long time at Shin Karate. Uh, I don't think I started getting noticed until they started becoming a little more progressive um, in the way that they, uh, they developed students, which for me was like late red belt. So I went and saw a Mysterious World show and that was Master Gordon. That was Master Gordon's thing. He did it for, um, I think the charity was called Kencrest. Yeah. So I think it was a, a special needs charity. I'm not sure if they still exist or not. But, and then uh, when I was a Chodambo, I got asked to be on the demo team to be in it. And that was like super cool, man. That was, it was a fun experience. Um, that's the one uh, I was under uh, Master Marvel. It was Mr. Marvel back then. He was a Samdan, one of the, Another one of the former world champs in that Shin Karate lineage there. Mm -hmm. And the, the big highlight of the show was me attacking him and he had a cane. He, oh my goodness, I had, I had these welts across my rib cage. None of this stuff happened when you were rehearsing it, right? But we get to the show and all of a sudden it's like, are you possessed by the devil? <laughs> Remember, it's me, Rob, your, your buddy, that stop beating me like this. He threw me at one point and I had never been thrown uh in the in the actual like stage with the stage lighting and everything and i just remember being up in the air and the stage lights spinning and just losing my orientation completely i had no idea where i was <laughs> so i just went limp and prayed i would land on my back and i and i did it was, and then i got whacked with it in the video you can see a piece of the cane break off and shoot across the room what's, uh, what's up with you and uh bro broken weapons and demonstrations eh? yeah broken staff with you and master waters one time yeah yeah he kept going though that's right that's okay. the, show must I think, um, the last ken crest show i think was one where master fisher uh hit a wet spot on the stage because they had this um it wasn't me but someone had did the, the bucket things with the water and sloshed some water on the stage and he came out and he did a flying sidekick and landed and hit the water he went right through the stage lights like mm -hmm. all these fluorescent lights exploded and burst in the air and he popped up he's like i'm okay <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So, so I still remember, did you have a picture of you with the bike spokes? Or oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I can see it up in the oh, of my eye here. And I remember you asking you about, so if, if, for those who don't know, there was 
I'm not sure who last did it, but you get a bed of nails, you stand on them, and then they would put a bike spoke through the skin here. They were Harley Davidson motorcycle spokes that were sharpened. Yeah. So. And then you hang five five gallon or uh, yeah, two and a half gallon buckets of water off of off of each arm. So like. I remember asking you about that, and you were just like, "Yeah, I was I was stupid and young." <laughs> You know, it's one of those things, like, I guess it's a youth thing. You look at it and you go, wow, that's cool, man. That must be like my next, my next step to being a master, that mind over matter kind of thing. Later, mind over matter uh, came to mean to us, if, if you don't mind, it don't matter. Right. <laughs> I don't know why we thought we would get students from it. I think we probably scared more people off by doing crap like that. You know? I'm glad I did it. I mean, it was a great deterrent for uh, some of my daughter's suitors. <laughs> just sit that put that right at the door is like mm -hmm. oh oh what's this <laughs> i did that for fun imagine what i'd do for my kid <laughs> <laughs> yeah right this, this was my hobby i just did this because it looked interesting there's, there's a reason you don't see us doing that kind of stuff anymore you know it just makes us look sort of like a, a, a cult of lunatics i guess right. but it's all right i got the pictures it's like getting a t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, Grandma, you talked about Grandmaster Shin and always saying hi to him. Do you remember the first time you actually got a chance to talk to him? I think the first real conversation I had with him uh, was, of all places, in England. Oh. Um, 1988, they, uh, they had the first European championship. This is I'm not going to put people to sleep with, with these stories. But, no, this is uh, why we're here. We're here for stories, I guess. 1988, um, I was a red belt and was competing. You know, I, I'm, I'm not tearing the world up as a competitor. I'm getting seconds, thirds. You know, I'm consistently placing, but I'm you know, not a grand champion or anything like that. Uh, a friend of mine sees an ad in, Black, I think it was Black Belt Magazine, advertising the first World Tung Sudo European Championship calls me up on the phone. Remember those? <laughs> and says, "Hey, you going?" I'm like, dude, I work in a recording studio. I had to move home. I'm I'm a broke musician. What makes you think I could fly to England for a karate tournament? It's like, oh, okay. Hangs up. Calls me back in an hour. Tells me to get a pen out and gives me flight information. The guy went ahead and booked my flight to England and a return flight. He says, "You know, you fill in the pieces where to stay and all that stuff." And you, know, you pay me back, you pay me back. If you don't, you don't. Pay it forward. I'm like, okay. So I ended up uh, flying to England, and I had arranged with uh, Master Khan at the time to, uh, to stay with somebody there, uh, a host family. And uh, somewhere when I was in the air to England, I, hopefully if Master Khan sees this, he remembers this story, his father or someone got sick, and I think they were in Pakistan, and the whole family gets up, and they leave and they forgot about yours truly flying to the UK. <laughs> so I land in England and this, there's no text, there's no cell phone. I get in the pay phone and someone picks up the phone and uh, they didn't really know what I was talking about. And sort of in broken English told me that they're not here. They, they flew or whatever. And, okay. So now I'm alone in England with uh, no funds. <laughs> I had brought enough money for uh, souvenirs and a cab ride home. So now I'm wandering London. Uh, the story's getting longer and longer. I'll get back to the Grandmaster Shin part. You're good, man. In a second. Um, yeah, so I'm wandering around London. And I finally figured out that there were things called youth hostels, which were kind of like YMCAs. And I checked into a youth hostel and ended up hooking up with a couple of uh, American guys. And we, we were all broke wandering around London and pulling our money together to like share a bed and breakfast. That's awkward, you know, being with like two complete total strangers from all over the country. And, um, anyway, long story short, I ended up running into, uh, he's no longer with WTSDA, but a, uh, one of the masters from Holland, Master Timmers, saw me in the street in my sweatshirt and started talking to me in perfect English. And I told him my story and they adopted me and they, they got me hooked up and they got me to, uh, they got me down to uh, where I needed to be. And uh, that Friday night before the tournament was when Grandmaster Shim was arriving. So we're in uh, a Royal Air Force base. We're in like one of their uh, cafeterias or mess halls or something like that. And uh, you know how everyone, you know, Grandmaster's coming, everybody stand up, face the door, doors open up, he comes in, quadrant of the cadet, everybody bows. 
and he looks around the room, he looks at me and he goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> ah, don't point me out. <laughs> Comes straight over in a beeline, how you get here? <laughs> I flew, sir. Oh, you got, you got tongue Su spirit. Moves on. So I think that was the longest conversation I'd have with him ever up to that point. And then the, uh, after the tournament, the day I was, uh, next day I was going to leave. They had a kind of an after gathering at uh, Master Khan's house. And he called me out in the hallway away from everyone in the, in the room having conversations. And he said, uh, you have a ticket home? I think he knew I was a broke musician and I had no right to be in there. I said, yes, sir. He said, show me. He made me show him my airline tickets because I think he was, I think he would have bought me a ticket home. Now he may have, you know, charged me interest on it or something, but he was going to make sure his boy wasn't going to get left overseas washing dishes, trying to, you know, hop a freighter back home or something mm -hmm. like that. And that really, man, that, that made a, a heck of an impact on me. So like I said, I never really had any true conversations with him up to that point. Just a, hi, Bob. Bye, Bob. One of three people on earth that called me Bob. <laughs> Yeah, that was all. That's one of my uh, other favorite things about that is, you know, I knew you as Rob. And like you said, <laughs> the large majority of people call you Rob, but for some reason, he always called you Bob. He did. He even uh, we used to get uh, instructor gifts and in back in the day, they would send us like cardigan sweaters and it would, you know, have your name on it. And he always put Bob Claus on it. <laughs> OK, it's like trying to yell. It's like trying to argue with your parents, you know. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, yeah, I've, I've heard that story before, but it's, a, you know, it's a great story. And this is the format that we, you know, we love long winded stories, or at least I do. <laughs> um, the, the numbers didn't go down, you know, based on your how long they're you're sleeping with their heads on their keyboards. They're still watching. <laughs> <laughs> Master K said, fine, Bob. Uh, <laughs> So uh, moving on uh, down the timeline here, you eventually make your way to Korean martial arts by way of Master Gordon kind of giving you a, a referral to, to get the job. Can you talk about that for me? The referral? Or just the fact, you know, getting the opportunity to take take a job with uh, Master Gowan down in Delaware. So at, at Shin Karate, um, myself, uh, Master Fisher was another one. We were both volunteers there. Neither of us got paid. Uh, we didn't even get like discounts on t-shirts or tuition or anything, but we would come in and teach. Um, I know Monday, Wednesday was my, I, I taught the adult beginners Monday, Wednesday night. That was my class. Uh, I think Brian was teaching the kids classes. As well, he was, he looked a lot, you know, he was younger than me and he looked a lot younger than me. Then you would not believe what he looked like. He's like a little, a little, now he's this hulking beast, right? He was like this skinny little kid before that. Um, a guy with a sure. What's that? You were a guy with a mullet. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had, a, I had a spectacular mullet and I was playing in bands and stuff like that. And, uh, but I mean, I was a karate geek. I showed up every day at a regular job. 8 to 4.30, 4.30, I went home, microwave food, ran down to the karate school, and I, and I stayed there. You know, our classes used to end at like 9.30 at night. Can you imagine running classes till 9.30 at night today? That, that's not a thing, right? Yeah. But we'd run till 9.30, we'd bow out, and then uh, Mr. Marvel would keep uh, me and Brian and, and some other guys, you know, ask us to stay, and he would beat the ever-loving poop out of us until 11 o'clock, and go home, shower, and do it again the next day. So one day I'm at, at my day job, uh, get home, and my dad says, uh, John Godwin called you. And instantly, like, this terror just, like, struck my soul and blood went cold. So uh, Master Godwin was my original instructor in 84, and then in 86 he set out to open the school in Delaware. Um, he was a very different man than, than the one that you knew and were employed by and all that. He was scary, man. Uh, just an uh, intense competitor, just like really intense guy. Just being around him just scared me to death. And uh, when I heard that he called me, like my first thought was, what did I do wrong? Did I break protocol at a tournament? Did I forget to bow? So there must be something. There's no reason on earth he would call me. So I called him back and he has to have lunch with me in a couple days. And the first thing I did was I drove down to the karate school and started asking uh, Mr. Marvel, 
why does he want to eat with me? Why does he, why does he want to meet with me? What did I do wrong? I said, no, I think he's open to the school. He's probably looking to hire somebody. Nah, that can't be right. <laughs> <laughs> my black belt, the ink was still wet in my black belt, you know? The dye was still wet in my black belt. I only had it. I got promoted. Um, I was in the uh, October test of 89, but we didn't actually get our belts around our waist in January. And this was like August. This was all happening. So uh, anyway, I went to lunch with him and, and he, uh, he told me he wanted to uh, offer me an opportunity to be an instructor for a living. And I'm like, nah, I, I, you, don't, you don't want me. I'm just a black, I, I'm just got my black belt. I'm not the right guy. As you know, he can be very persuasive and he talked me into it. And uh, you know, obviously I'm still incredibly grateful to this day that he bothered to talk me into it because everything that's great in my life right now is because of that decision to take a, at the time a pretty hefty pay cut and go teach karate for a living. Yeah. It, it's funny, you know, I, I'm listening to you say that. And I remember me, I was uh, same in the same boat. I was not even a black belt yet. And George was just like, Hey, you, you know, you want a part-time, it was a part-time job at that point. He's like, you want to go to Hocast? And I was like, what do they need me for? I'm not even black belt. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that that whole pay it forward thing come comes around you know what i mean like i i, yeah. I, I see that um so talk to us about starting the the where it was it was in a basement originally correct it was it was in a 1200 square foot uh basement <laughs> about mm, let's say mile and a half from here over on route 41 in, in hocas and in 1990 Hocas, I mean, Hocasson's not exactly a, I wouldn't call it an urban center by any means. It was a lot less so in 1990. It was pretty barren out here. No traffic light, no Wawa, none of that stuff. All that stuff didn't exist. Um, and we were in a little tiny basements, uh, 1,200 square foot. That included uh, two fairly generous sized dressing rooms, an office, a little intro room, a wall separating the lobby from the training floor, two steel pipes holding the ceiling up, <laughs> and uh, of course the actual bathroom. So it was pretty small and eight foot ceilings, which is real interesting when you're spinning your bong around, spinning your long staff around. So we actually had mushrooms growing in one corner of the carpet one day. <laughs> nice. Welcome to Hocas. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did those early days look as far as getting new students in? Was was it a, it was hard? Did it did they trickle in kind of slowly? How did it how did it, that? It, it trickled in. Um, we've always I mean we did I did a lot of footwork. I was doing anything to you know to get paid and have that job. So I was you know flyering parking lots and I remember a security guard at Price's Corner making me go around and unflyer all the cars. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about running from him, but then, you know, it would have reflected bad. Master Goblin would have had to explain why I was trespassing and all that right. stuff. So, but, you know, we, we did a lot of door-to-door uh, -door and, and demonstrations and all kinds of stuff back then. It was just a different world. There was no internet. So you were rolling the dice with yellow pages. You were rolling the dice with mailers. Um, I remember when one of the, I think it was the third Ninja Turtle movie came out. Um, I went to Domino's in Avondale and asked him if I could print up a bunch of things because we had some licensing agreement with EFC, remember EFC? We had some sort of licensing thing where we could use the turtle logo and put it on pizza boxes for Domino's right. and send people to our school. And mostly what that resulted in was people seeing my phone number instead of the Domino's number and calling my number and ordering the pizzas. <laughs> nice. <laughs> The smart aleck in me started taking the orders, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> I could see that. I could see that. It's a long time ago. I'm a different man now. <laughs> yeah, right. I was speaking a long time ago. Mike Partee just yelled, said uh, Ed Gruberman. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we, we'll we, leave we'll, it to Partee to pick my scab. <laughs> I know, right? We might have to get it back around to that. So you're uh, you're leading classes. When when do you eventually get? Uh, a young master, or then Mr. E, uh, to to help you out uh, in Hocassin. Oh, first, my first day in Hocassin when I came oh, okay. down here. Yeah, because he lived at, um, lived with his grandmother on Brackenville Road. He, That's right. He could, I think, 
Well, he used to have this cool little yellow Subaru, but he, he could have walked if he wanted to. Probably would have been killed on Brackenville Road because it's like this narrow. <laughs> but yeah, no, he, he came with the building. Um, so I met him at Newport, which was the original KMAI. And he walked up and it's an incredibly polite young man saying, oh, sir, my name is Erwin Waters. If there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. I'm like, oh, yeah, great. We'll be working together. Uh, that night in class, we get lined up to spar and we bow. And, you know, if, if you don't know who Master Waters is, Master Waters is a big dude. He's always been a big dude. And I was, uh, and I was really skinny then. I was probably like 170 pounds soaking wet. That included my mullet. <laughs> All that was giving me extra power. Nice. Um, but I lined up the spar with him and I thought, well, you know, I know I'm going to be faster than him. I don't want to embarrass the big guy, so I'll just take it easy on him. We bow and make a fighting stance. Homeboy jumps up in the air and does a wheel kick that passes like this close to my nose. I'm like, oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe taking it easy on the big guy is not necessary. <laughs> It was terrifying. <laughs> the foot was like the sonic boom when it went by. Yeah, so he uh, he came out to Hook House and every day joined me in the basement. He was usually there before I got there. He was already cleaning. Uh, you were his roommate once for a while, so you know he's a, a he's a cleanaholic. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So back then was was. Was he still learning how to use his voice as far as being a trained an instructor? Was he, he still a good, uh, already a good instructor? When did he? He so was all right. He, he has a, he has a, uh, he has a gift for it. Um, and it needed to get polished. Right. Uh, Cause you know, like if, if you're an instructor and you haven't made an embarrassing mistake in your life, I think you're really an instructor. Yeah. <laughs> if you didn't say something incredibly stupid or do something incredibly stupid, you're either lucky or lying. You know, yeah. um, but he, you know, he, he had to learn how to uh, handle that kind of strength like everybody else does. The thing was, I, I recognized really quickly that he was better with kids than I was. And I was better in the office than he was. So, you know, swallow your ego, send him out, let him lead these kids and you go in and sign people up. And that, that combination worked really well. We grew that school. Not that I didn't teach. I mean, I still went out and taught classes and was the right. figurehead, but he, he did uh, a ton of the legwork on, on the actual instruction. And we grew that school to almost 300, we were over 330 students at one point in the, in the heyday before. Sure, yeah, I remember, I, so I came in 2004 and you guys were rolling with that, you know, that pattern, that, kind of set up where yeah that was like that was like the pinnacle of it oh five i think it like oh six it kind of oh seven yeah. it went off a cliff <laughs> yeah I've, I've said this to you and i've said it to a lot of people um coming there as a, a fresh i was 24 years old black belt thinking i was pretty good and sharp and coming there and, and just getting a, a lesson in humility and how to teach how to run a how to run a, uh, a studio that was me going to kmai same thing 24 years old yeah <laughs> so um you know I, I just that was obviously far past the basement but um you talked about this earlier when you were talking about now in cornerstone the the students that help out and and go above and beyond and i feel like it, at least i'm sure it's past that but even that back then you you had lots of or quite a few students that went above and beyond and helped out and were always there for you. Um, what where do you think that comes from? Is that just leadership? Uh, you know, from from you, from Master Waters, just breeding a uh, you know that kind of community. I me I, I I think it's a God thing, man. I think you know we've just been really blessed out here. Uh, to just be around such such great people, I'm very hesitant to take any kind of credit for leadership. You know, I just had the right people around me, and uh, it just always seemed to be the right people here. And if they uh, they buy into the culture, that's just part of what we've always been. Um, they they just seem to buy into that culture, man, and they'll they'll give you the shirt off their back. I mean, these people have been incredible. You know, if just if you if you genuinely love your people, they're going to know that, you know, 
uh, without without getting too sappy or too uh, ethereal or anything like that. I think that that kind of thing that that culture just perpetuates itself. If you create an environment like that and uh, expect it, people will buy into it. Also, think it helps that you love what you you know when you love what you do. I've taken many classes from you, and and you just genuinely love teaching and sharing the art. That God, it's still fun, man. <laughs> I, I still, and I, I try to, I try to emulate that when I work with students. Just seeing the the joy of you, like grabbing a grabbing a lock, and it just popping right into place, or yeah. <laughs> Yeah, into the face. <laughs> it's, it's not always easy. I mean, like anyone, I mean, we all get tired. We all get, we all feel a little burned. Man, there's there have been times when I'm like, do I really want to even do this anymore? And then, I don't know. I'll see a a, a Max Renoy who just embraces, you know, leading the creativity team and, and just the the fun that the kids are having or, or uh, the passion like Peggy Del Fabro puts into the tournament team. And, uh, and Fiona and her team with uh, with the Black Belt Prep. And well, I don't want to leave names out. There's so many of them. It's hard to, to jam them all in there. But these people are doing it just because they love it. And that's that's contagious, you know. I try not to let my own fatigue, you know, uh, poison that. So and that's, I think that's the biggest challenge is, is keeping your own little demons in check and making sure you're not piddling on their fire right. <laughs> do you have a seven second delay can i say piddling <laughs> you're good no yeah no delay. we're doing it live um you know it's like you said doing it 35 years you're bound to have some some peaks and valleys <laughs> yeah but it, it, it's helpful to have uh like you said the students that come in the people that are dedicated that those people put a smile on your face, right? There's yeah, man, their, their passion for training gets me charged back up to want to, to work out. You know? Absolutely. I'm lucky with, uh, with uh, Master Ray Broda as my, as my business partner. The guy's an animal when it comes to working out. Yeah. And uh, there are times when I'm just like, I see him post for the 9,000th time that he's, you know, kicking his bag or whatever. I'm like, God, I'm such a slacker. <laughs> but he's it, it pushes me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or riding a bike or whatever yes yeah he's the one that got me into riding mountain bikes and uh i own big on that one that is a lot of fun it, mountain bikes are fun they're good times except that weekend where i went over the handlebar three times that was oh. that wasn't quite as much fun but hopefully your uh your <laughs> have keto tone pseudo training uh kicked in and you were able to roll out of it <laughs> sort of yeah right into a rock <laughs> <laughs> So outside of your Tung Sudo training, you've trained pretty extensively in other uh, kind of disciplines and styles. Could you just talk talk about um, some of the things that you've done outside of uh, the world of Tung Sudo? I don't know about extensively. Um, sporadically is probably a better title. Hapkido was extensively. Uh, were, you there, were you there from the beginning of Hapkido? Were you there when we first started? Not, not the very beginning. I No. So you missed the really awful beatings for the first the first couple of years, or whatever. But uh, yeah, so we trained extensively with uh, Grandmaster Jihan Jay. Uh, Master Goblin was so great about bringing outside instructors in for us, and uh, I loved Hapkido. I had a lot of fun with it. I still do. So I probably I don't know how many years that is now. It's got to be coming up on twenty, I think. Maybe more. I guess more. I don't know. Time flies. Yeah, right. <laughs> Getting old. Um, I dabbled in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, not as much as you have, obviously. Um, just a little bit here and a little bit there. Not enough to even get my first little black stripe on my white belt. I was never able to get a streak. Um, Muay Thai. I've done probably I've probably done more of Muay Thai than anything else other than Hapkido with uh, Utaki Athletics. And that's a lot of fun because I don't have to fight but I love hitting pads and uh, it's made me a better boxer. It's made me better in, uh, in thinking of combinations and movement for fighting and things like that. It's improved my footwork a lot. Um, we did a, I think a year of Tai Chi again, under, under master Godwin's um, bringing in an outside instructor, uh, master Kevin's son, 
<clears throat> mostly most of what I remember about that was him telling me how much better my wife was at Tai Chi than I was. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I know. You said this every week for the last six weeks. <laughs> um, I did. I've done a lot of training in uh, uh, with Scientific Fighting Congress, which is Hawk Hawk Heim out of uh, out of Denton, Texas, and that's more like it's Krav Maga without the sexy title. <laughs> like it's just it's just straight up fighting combatives. It's weapons. It's guns. It's knives. It's sticks. Uh, it's grappling. It's you know fighting with all those things on the ground, on your knees, on your back, on your stomach, all those kind of things. That I guess I've trained in that. Uh, pretty extensively that that's that's sort of a passion for me that's where um those who are at the master clinic and they've taken my uh, gun defense course that's where all that stuff came from there's nothing new under the sun though man. all this stuff is just so interconnected yeah i think that's one of the great things of doing cross training is you realize that how easily most of this stuff can be uh put into your you know, Tung Sudo classes. Yeah, there's only I mean, there's only so many ways to move the human body. You know, <laughs> it's a yeah. finite number of movements. So, <laughs> so we we kind of we talked about it a little bit, but how you you bought the studio from Master Godwin and, and renamed it Cornerstone. Maybe talk about the name, where did the name Cornerstone came from, and and how long has it been now? Uh, Master Ray Broad and I took over, I believe, July 1st, 2016. Okay. And, um, you know, we were, we were searching for, for a name and throwing stuff back and forth. And, uh, at, at first, we, since he had Iron Circle Martial Arts, we were trying to incorporate some kind of circle in there, <laughs> into the title. We were looking at, like, full circle. Oh, no, there's, like, five of them within a 10-mile radius. Okay, can't use that name. Going around and around, I believe it was Master Waters um, that suggested Cornerstone as a name. If he didn't suggest it as a name, he's the one that did the the design for the logo. But um, uh, for one thing, uh, for me personally, because of my faith, Cornerstone uh, Crisis, the Cornerstone. So that for me was like a little nod to my to my faith there. And uh, and also um, we've always thought of our school when it was KMI Hocus and as being kind of a, a cornerstone of the community, something the community could build on. Because we've always felt we were more than just a martial arts school. We felt like we were producing, trying to produce anyway, good people to make things, you know, make things around them stronger and spread exponentially. So that's that's your twofold uh, purpose there. You know, for the secular person, it's, uh, you know, cornerstone of the community. Uh, for those that have a little more insight into, uh, into scripture, it's, it's the other meaning, or it's both. <laughs> I definitely think that that, you know, you talk about trying to build students into better humans. Um, and, you know, through Facebook, I'm, I'm friends with so many people now where kids that we taught back, you know, even going back as far as I go four or five or six, like they're now adults that have lot you know kids and yeah they're bringing us their kids makes you feel like a granddad doesn't it yeah. <laughs> master wheeler says he loves the name sir ah thank you master wheeler <laughs> um you know we're talking about the kids i probably one of the first intros i ever did at Ho in hokesson was your daughter <laughs> yes um talk about your family a, a little bit because obviously i know that family is a big part of your life um, obviously it should be, but, um, yeah, talk about your wife and, and, and kids. And like you said, uh, all, all good things in your life came through the martial arts. Much yeah, like they did, man. They did. You know, I, I started martial arts because I got dumped by a woman. Then I found the greatest woman in the world because I was in martial arts. So it kind of, the payoff was much better. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nicole's awesome. Uh, we've been married. 21 or 22 years 99 got married in 99 and i guess coming up on 22 years in september uh we met here at the school she was a student and uh, we were friends first and then started dating and uh, got married shortly thereafter and um, we have two wonderful kids uh, sonia is my eldest so my wife was a second don she did make sense she actually worked here for a while uh, the second don was no small accomplishment being as she needed her hip replaced 
like probably the entire time she trained <laughs> and didn't get it done until after she got her second degree. She's like, I want to wait till I get my second degree, then I'll get the hip replaced. And then it was, I want to wait till I have a baby, then I'll get the hip replaced. So anyway, uh, Sonia is is uh, going to be 20 in April. Wow. How's that make you feel? Yeah, right. <laughs> and she is waiting to find out she's going to get into the army. Uh, just a great kid. Her work ethic is is insane. She has like three jobs, four jobs, I think. You know, she works at uh, for a, a local vet hospital for one of my students. She's a lifeguard at the YMCA. She's a volunteer EMT at the fire company. Um, she does DoorDash when she has five minutes to spare. And she works for the Delaware Readiness and Training Group that does all the firearms training too. So a real slacker, not a kid. Yeah, yeah. And, and she house sits. If someone says house sit for me, I'll pay. And she's like, woo! <laughs> she's on it. Uh, Kiara is still in high school. She's supposed to be, a, she's a junior, but she's gonna, she's in the early graduation program. So she's gonna graduate this year. Uh, and she works at the vet hospital. She also coaches trampoline. She's also a level 10 gymnast, which is one step under elite. Uh, not gymnast, um, trampoline athlete. So if you've never seen trampoline, it's pretty freaking wicked. <laughs> Definitely an extreme sport. And, and they're both black belts as well, right? What's that? Uh, Sonia got her second degree, right? And, yep. Uh, and Kiara got her first degree. Yeah, I have a, a, one of my favorite pictures is you... Uh, with your arm around Kiara and Kiara, you're both kissing your belts for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> I think she's like five in the picture or something like that. <laughs> That's awesome. It's a hilarious uh, picture. Yeah, it's great memories. I, I remember that picture. Um, you know, one of the things seeing the office and I, I put it in the questions. So uh, for those that don't know, I don't know how many years Grandmaster Shin lived uh, in Pennsylvania there, but Grandmaster Shin lived maybe five minutes from the dojo. Yeah. Uh, and in heavy traffic. And, yeah, exactly. In heavy traffic. So <laughs> maybe share some, some stories of, uh, being able to interact with him, you know, uh, back then. Yeah, that was, that was pretty hilarious. No, no pressure there. Just the grand master of the association decides to move into your neighborhood. <laughs> Now you're we had him for gup testing one time. We did. We had him here for gup testing. He was always very gracious. Um, I think a, a lot of people, it's a shame that there's so many, there's a whole generation of martial arts that aren't going to know him because uh, he was, he was really cool. He's great sense of humor. Yeah. Really great sense of humor. But yeah, so he would, uh, he would use my studio as like a shipping point because no tax in Delaware, right? He'd have <laughs> everything sent to me. And he'd call me and say, oh, I'm expecting a delivery. Uh, just let me know when it comes here. And let me know when it comes here is code for put it in your car and drop it off on your way home. Even if your way home is, you know, 15 minutes in the other direction, it doesn't matter. I was like, I, he, definitely, he definitely pulled up in the association van a couple of times to get like rugs and. and, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. There were some things he didn't expect me to put in my car. He like ordered an oriental rug or something like that. He'd show up in the van and we'd, we'd load it in there. Uh, one time, I think he forgot his belt or something. I think that's the picture that you had. You guys belt in uniform, and his wife dropped it off here, and I pulled up the. I took a picture of myself holding it and sent it out to some people. Uh, can I can I share that? Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's see if I, I wonder if I can pop it up. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually showed him that picture, and he punched me in the arm. <laughs> I forget what he said. Oh, he said, I, I kill you. I kill you. He punched me in the arm, so my arm went numb. <laughs> Old fella could still hit. <laughs> when he would go away, he would call me and ask me to come take care of his plants. And uh, the first time he did it, he made me come over his house. And I swear, I, no, no exaggeration. It was like, it was like Miyagi and Daniel-san, him showing me exactly how he wanted me to water his plants. And I'm like, Sir, I am like 37 years old. I think I can figure out how to water a plant. No, no, no. This over here, this one here. Pick these. Don't pick these. Like, got it, sir. Thank you. <laughs> I think my favorite is when we we helped to move and you found the the little cardboard. Yes, he gave me the he gave me the cardboard thing from the world championships. Yeah. So you have, you have those pictures. I don't have that, but someone, it, it, one of the creativity, 
uh, someone, they were doing a demo and talking about like building the headquarters and someone did like a cutout of him, like with his arms up, like, yeah. And so we helped Grandmaster Shin move and <laughs> Master Kloss asked if he could have it. And Master Grandmaster Shin just kind of laughed and, and, <laughs> and said yes. Um, and then a number of us would get uh, videos from Grandmaster Shin. <laughs> uh you know the I, made pers I made personal messages from him and the first thing i did was i put it in my mazda and i belted it in and put my <laughs> arm around it took a took a selfie and i showed him those pictures too that's funny. Said he had a good sense of humor he had a really good sense of humor <laughs> that's great um so or my tolerance for me one or the other <laughs> probably a little both <laughs> So nowadays, what what's inspiring you as far as martial arts? Like being able, being, what gets you motivated to to get out on the floor and, and train? Is it the same as it's always been? Has it changed at all? I don't I don't think it's changed that much. Um, I, I am driven a little bit by the fear that I'm 55, and you know I'm not. I don't. You know, I watch myself moving on uh, on video now. If I videotape a killing or something to troubleshoot it, or if someone uh, videotaped me at, at Muay Thai hitting pads, and I look at myself and go, "Are you always that slow?" <laughs> so I'm motivated a little bit by the fear of losing athleticism. It's inevitable, right? It's going to happen. Um, I just hope I can still move as well as like a Grandmaster Strong moves. You know, when I when I move, he already still moves better than I do. I'm just hoping to cling desperately to what I have here and, and move on. But um, not letting my students down is a motivator. Uh, I still genuinely love martial arts. It's just, uh, as you know, last year was brutal. I'm um, keeping my mind focused on anything other than, uh, you know, not being angry at the world and everybody in it and everybody responsible for everything uh, around me channeling that into something positive so it's still there i still i still love the arts um you know you you pull up youtube and watch some uh, sabaki challenge or something like that get all fired up <laughs> i had a friend loan me his credentials for netflix so i'm binging uh, cobra kai 3 right now oh yes my wife <laughs> is the karate is any good in that but i'm ashamed to say i still love it <laughs> so you mentioned you're 55. Any any uh, words of advice for for someone who is is whether they're looking to train or continue to train? Um, any words of advice as far as uh, continuing to train? Because for me, I always enjoy training with you because you you train when you train you train hard, <laughs> and there were many many uh, trainings where you know. You, I'm I'm 40, so you're 15 years younger than me, and you would you wouldn't know. Years younger, 15, yeah. <laughs> um, so any words of advice for for anyone who's out there that wants to continue to train hard? Uh, just be smart. Is that the main moderation, thing? man? Moderation. Just don't. <laughs> it's the advice you're not allowed to give your students anymore. Don't be stupid. <laughs> you know, or uh, these these machines. They wear out, you know, you hit, for me, it was like I hit 48 and my check engine light started coming on all the time. So the forties <laughs> were, the early forties were still pretty good. I was still pretty good, but um, it's not, it's not the age, it's the miles. So you just gotta be, be careful. I and mean, I did all those ultra marathons and stuff when I was younger and man, I think, I think, I think I did some permanent damage during some of those races, you know? I wish, I, wish I could get some of those miles back. <laughs> they weren't worth the t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, just you, you gotta you gotta think for the long run, and I think about it more all the time now. You know, I just I just I lost a bunch of weight over the pandemic. I lost like thirty some pounds, and I'm determined not to put that back on. I don't I don't want to be a, an, an old fat guy trying to lumber his way through Bossai. <laughs> Fat master. I know it used to be my goal to be the fattest master in the association, but <laughs> at some point I realized I didn't really like the look. So yeah, right. <laughs> master Wheeler says my check light engine light is stuck on, so I just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that worked out with me well for my Pathfinder, sir. You may want to check that. 
<laughs> my engine seized in Kennett Square. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> so we're uh, we're hitting the hour mark. Is there any anything else you want to share before we wrap up? No, man. You're the interrogator. <laughs> I you know I appreciate uh, your invitation coming out here. I've enjoyed watching the interviews. I think it's been a fun uh, diversion during these times. Hopefully. Um, Hopefully you continue it even when it's not a diversion anymore. <laughs> yeah, it, it's definitely my plan to do that. Um, yeah, thank you again for sharing. Like you said, there's there's a generation and it's gonna continue of people. We have black belts and probably close to third degree black belts that were not around when Grandmaster Shen was alive. No, no, you know? it's, it's uh it's a shame. He was a he was a really he was a really interesting and uh, and and great guy. Um, you know, I, I find myself at odd times. It's not like I interacted with him all the time and had like this father son relationship or anything like that. Um, but I still felt like a bond with him. You know, when he talked to you, uh, he talked to you, not yeah. like through you. you know, he knew you. He knew your family. Uh, he genuinely cared and. Uh, you know, if, there's, if there's any lesson to take from him beyond, you know, one more time and stuff like that, it's to genuinely care about the people you deal with. You know, you talk about the culture of the school before, and I think that's that's the key, man. And you don't even have to like everybody in your school, but you got to love them, right. if that makes sense. Yeah, just like family, right? <laughs> yep. You don't have to like them, but you got to love them. <laughs> well, thank you again for your time, sir. I really appreciate it. Um, I look forward to getting a chance to be in person and actually uh, get to train. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to that. I get sidekicked in the head from you now, especially since I'm like, I'm like only a quarter as fast as you now. <laughs> well, you probably got me on weight. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to slim down like you. Uh, so you catch me, catch me before I get down your weight. And <laughs> <laughs> I ain't that skinny. <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you everyone for watching. I really appreciate it. And Master Klaus, thanks for joining me. Thank you, my friend. Take care. All right, come soon. Thanks,